Hi, I'm Jeff Walters, and welcome to The Minutes. And thanks for listening today. It's great to have you on On The Minutes for the week of June the 24th, 2024. This is a City of Thunder Bay podcast. The Minutes takes a look at what happened at Thunder Bay City Council this past week. You can find The Minutes wherever you get your podcasts, including our YouTube channel and our website, thunderbay.ca slash The Minutes. If you want to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening at City Hall, just hit that subscribe button. On the episode, we'll have a rundown of what happened at this week's City Council meeting and an interview with Cynthia Olson and Riley Willenden regarding encampments and what the city can do about them and also how to support the people living there. We'll also have an interview with Norm Gale, the now-retired city manager. That's coming up in just a couple of minutes. But first, Council started off with four deputations and a written request to not sell some parkettes in Thunder Bay. The land was identified by the city as being a potential space for infill housing. There has been vocal opposition from some neighborhoods to the sale of the parkettes. Now, Thistle, Holly, and Thornwell parkettes are still excluded from being declared as surplus land after a resolution tabled by Councillor Brian Hamilton lost. But Council did defer the surplusing of the Woodside, Woodside parkette for six months, until January of 2025. Council learned about the 2025 proposed budget calendar. Internally, administration will assemble much of the capital budget information over the summer and fall. Council will get its first look at the budget in early 2025, with the public getting budget information on January the 17th of 2025. Ratification of the budget is expected by February the 10th of next year. Council got its first look at the multi-year accessibility plan. The plan has 12 actions and concepts to make Thunder Bay more accessible. The actions include removing physical barriers, providing accessible public engagement, upgrading transit stops, improving sidewalks and ramps, and the installation of audible crossing signals at intersections. Council approved a contract with Scatliff, Miller, and Murray as a consultant to help rebuild the Waterfronts Festival area. The three-quarter of a million dollar contract is part of an overall five million dollar job. The contract awarded on Monday will include schematic designs for the festival area, determining project sequencing and construction schedules, and contract administration for the area. Some of the goals for the festival area include increasing the number of people that can be on the site, improving public transportation and traffic flow in the area, creating a gateway to the festival area, and improving the biodiversity of the area. The stage will be moved to the north end of the site and angled away from the downtown core. Construction at the festival area will begin this fall. It will be completed in 2028. City Council spent a considerable amount of time talking about encampments on Monday, with Council approving some guidelines for encampments. The topic included two deputations from the public, which were opposed to the creation of a designated encampment area. A presentation from administration to council included guidelines for encampments, with an encampment being at least 100 metres away from schools, playgrounds, pools or splash pads. They would also have to be away from roads, private property, transit stops, heritage properties, multi-use fields and boat launches. There are also smaller setbacks for building entrances, sidewalks, off-leash dog parts, gardens and entrance ramps. The guidelines also limit the number of tents in one area. Council did approve the guidelines, but the distances in the guidelines are subject to an ongoing review. We'll hear more about designated encampments in just a few moments. And finally, Council made a couple of formal approvals on Monday night. Jean-Claude, or John Collin, was officially confirmed as the new city manager, effective at 8 a.m. on June the 25th. The passing of the bylaw is a formality of hiring Collin to the city's top job, And Dave Paxton was also confirmed as being the city's new fire chief. And that's a wrap as to what happened at Council this week. For more information on anything that happens at Council, please visit our website, thunderbay.ca slash council. There has been a lot of chatter about encampments in Thunder Bay. They are visible in the city, prominent locations in the north and south tours along some waterways as well. Now, council asked administration to find ways to deal with encampments, either through designated locations or maybe some guidelines right across Thunder Bay. Well, last night, council learned about possible options and agreed to the creation of some guidelines for encampments in the city. Riley Willinen is a policy and research analyst for the City of Thunder Bay, and Cynthia Olson is the Director of Strategy and Engagement. Cynthia, Riley, thanks for coming in today. Thanks for having us. So I'm going to start off with, uh, you brought forward a report a while ago about encampments. You were asked to come back with some more more details. What were the recommendations when it came to, to encampments? 
Yeah, so we brought forward essentially three types of recommendations to council. One was to adopt guidelines, um, which sets out a, a, you know some parameters for distances from particular areas within the community where encampments would be permissible or not permissible. Uh, the, the second option was to support a built structure uh, type of um, initiative on a city-owned lot uh, with support from a community organization and look for external funding. Um, and then a series of advocacy both uh, to the federal and provincial governments. So kind of three options there, three things that you laid out that were, were possibilities. Um, I guess what was, what was on the table last night and what, what happened at council last night? The guidelines uh, broadly so the 100 meter distance is around things that involve children typically. There's a 50 meter distance that involves uh, competing uses, so things like sports fields. There's a 20 meter distance that involves things around security and safety, so for example a highway. Um, and then there's things around tra transit stops and properties with heritage designations um, at a 10 meters. There's also um, a series of sensitive use type of areas that have a, a five meter uh, distance. And then there's also a direct within on a environmental protection zone and that's you know a health and safety reason and and, the, and these are guidelines right these aren't bylaws these aren't anything like that these are just guidelines that the city's putting out yeah correct so so i guess uh how would it work you know if, if there's these guidelines in place could a neighbor call and say i don't think they're abiding by these guidelines how would how would that kind of work yeah if there's uh, someone in the community that's concerned that the guidelines aren't being followed they can either go to the city's website on the report a page or sorry report a problem page there's a button for encampments alternatively you can also call dispatch and that's available for you 24 7 and then the task force will receive that report and we will make an assessment based on the guidelines okay let's go into the decision of council last night so they accepted the guidelines but there was lots of chat around the table. It was a, a multi-hour debate, uh, you could say. I, I guess, where are we doing with, uh, with encampments or, or designated sites in the future? So I'd just like to say that actually the, the guidelines are a form of designation. So we were presenting options and, and our best recommendation to council on how to actually do designated sites in a way that is within our jurisdiction, like as far as we do not receive provincial or federal dollars for homelessness. That's actually operated through the District of Thunder Bay Social Services Administration Board. But we have a responsibility because they lie within municipally owned lands. And so setting up guidelines and distance um, uh, parameters is one mechanism to identify what's, what's technically designated or permissible. The other was sanctioned, fully sanctioned sites, and we, we did not recommend that. So um, Riley may will want to speak a little bit more about the cost of those, um, you know, evidence about in, entrenchment, um, exit strategy. Uh, I don't know, Riley, do you want to add anything about like the rationale on why we didn't recommend that to council? Yeah, for sure. So as we've seen in other municipalities that have implemented sanction sites, um, there's significant concerns around the entrenchment of those encampment sites becoming just the normal response to, to homelessness. Okay. Yep. Um, and that's not advisable because as I'm sure we can appreciate, a tent isn't an appropriate shelter space. So that was one of our considerations when we made the recommendation to not pursue sanction sites. The cost is also quite hefty um, if you want to support people fully. So that was another reason because as Cynthia noted, we don't receive any provincial or federal funding directly to address homelessness. But I was going to say, if we're, if we're talking about the cost, so just looking from the report, it was millions. Like, it, like it's, not, it's not cheap to set up a site and then properly maintain it and have services. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, I, and part of the reason uh, for the recommendation is really the... Um, Court rulings in Ontario um, talk about uh, forced evictions. Um, well, we may have some mechanism to do some uh, assisted relocations, um, building and investing heavily in a fully sanctioned site does not actually mean that that's uh, going to support all the individuals who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Um, so the cost that was in the report also identified uh, the fact that that's 
just the cost for one, you would have to potentially times that by maybe up to six uh, with the current numbers that are outside right now in order to fully support them and not go over a certain threshold. Yeah, if I could just also add to that, the, another rationale for the reason why we decided to recommend against sanction sites was the land availability. So there was some criteria that we looked at to identify locations that would be suitable for those sanction sites um, and working under the best guidance that we've received to not let those sites surpass 25 individuals, sorry, 25 structures or 30 individuals. We'd need at minimum with the numbers that we are working with six sites and so when we looked at the criterias and we're trying to find six sites that would fit within those criteria, it wasn't possible. I was also going to ask, talking about sites, because there was chatter in the report or a section of the report that talked about putting aside some land at uh, Viscount Street and Simpson, Victoria area. I, I guess what happened with, with setting aside that land or, or potentially putting something there? Yeah, so the recommendation was to support uh, the potential exploration of a pilot project on uh, some previously identified city property. It was a parking lot. It was called the Viscount lot um, that had been uh, previously approved to close as far as parking. Uh, so it's municipally owned land. Um, and to work with community partners to source external funding uh, for uh, something like a like a pallet shelter village, we'll call it, um, which isn't a, you know, it's not considered an encampment. It's a temporary sheltering solution uh, to support individuals who are staying unsheltered uh, in, you know, not so lovely structures sometimes. Um, it does have quite a bit of cost. Um, and again, our, our recommendation to council was not that we take this on. Um, again, looking at who receives the funding for this, uh, but that we could support potentially with land. But there were some significant concerns from uh, the surrounding business community. There was some deputations. Um, and so ultimately, council uh, actually wanted to refer the whole report back. And so um, we were able to you know, collaborate internally and recommend to council that we actually just remove the Viscount lot completely from, from the recommendation. There still is, a, um, uh, they did approve a letter of support for this type of pilot. We don't necessarily know where that might be, but uh, you know, certainly there's, there's some support for the concept. And so um, at this point, that's off the table. So it's off the table, but maybe in the future with some support, something could come back. We don't know what it is. We don't know where, but something could come back. Potentially, yes. Potentially, okay. Yeah, yeah and, th and that seems to be kind of the story here, right? It's always a lot of potentials. We have some guidelines now, but there's still, there's still a lot of answers and, and such to be resolved. Yeah, and I'll just say, maybe you're going to go into this, like what's next? Um, so while they were approved last night, they actually don't get ratified till the 15th of July. And so th there was concern about um, uh, are, are the distances appropriate? And so we may see additional changes come the 15th. So right now, we have a set of guidelines that we've somewhat been trying to uh, implement uh, by working with our community partners, but until it's actually ratified, those distances could actually change. And, and I believe that it was also put in there that the, the distances could be um, changed in the future as well, right? This isn't something that's set in stone. Absolutely. Uh, we built into the recommendation so it was clear that these would have continual review. Um, we had just learned, you know, I think a few days prior uh, to bringing the, like getting the report across the finish line to council, which it, they, they did receive it very, very late. Um, but another community, their council had directed administration to increase the guidelines uh, from private residences to, it was 100 meters, Riley, um, which was new. And so, you know, as those things unfold, as we continue to monitor across Ontario, we can bring additional information and recommendations back to council to make amendments. Cynthia Riley, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you. Thanks. Riley Willinen is a policy and research analyst for the City of Thunder Bay, and Cynthia Olson is the Director of Strategy and Engagement. So after nearly nine years, Norm Gale is no longer the City Manager in Thunder Bay. 
last night, City Council passed a bylaw officially making John Collin the top bureaucrat in the city. And today, Tuesday, June the 25th, marks the last day that Norm Gale has an office. Well, sort of an office at City Hall. He moved out most of his items a couple of weeks ago. But Norm made some time to come into the Minute studio today to reflect on his career at the City of Thunder Bay. Norm, thanks for coming in today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jeff. Happy to do it. And I, I, have you ever dressed this casual before at City Hall? No. How does it well, feel? Well, actually, on Sunday mornings, when I would come in to do stuff, I'd, you know, sweatpants and a ball cap kind of thing. Sure. But uh, during the week, never. Never. Okay. <laughs> okay. How are you feeling today? Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I am a really happy guy. Um, the time was right. <clears throat> and once you, once you realize, once you know, you know. And I hadn't, it wasn't, there wasn't a long plan. There was no target. There was nothing like that. I always said I would be the city manager as long as they would have me. They being council. Um, but then uh, last, last December is when I really started to think about it. And uh, it was a quick decision and not looking back. I'm both grateful and happy. And what have the last uh, six months been like? It's, it's, uh, it, it, it's been surreal. I had never contemplated retirement ever, really, to any degree. And I always thought, well, I'm just going to keep on working, you know. And then when it comes, it comes, right? And in the six months uh, uh, after I made my announcement, the first few months were pretty routine, pretty normal. Then things start to change. And in the last two months or so, uh, I started experiencing the last ofs, the last of this type of meeting, right? the last uh, trip to Toronto to meet with this certain group of people. Uh, and the last few weeks were really the last ofs. Right. Because you also had John Collin by your side yes, showing yeah. him, here's who, here's who people yeah. are, here's how you get in the elevator kind of yeah. thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I was, I was happy to do that. And, uh. I have to say, I have a feeling, you know, John and I clicked quickly and he has experience as a city manager, of course. Uh, so I think, uh, I think council chose well. And as someone who lives in this city and will continue to live in this city, which is my hometown, uh, I hope he does well and I'm sure he will. Anything that you wanted to wrap up in the last six months that, you know, you just couldn't get done before yeah. you, before you walked out? Yes. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of things I can't talk about a few projects that uh, the executive management team are working on that are going to be handed to John now for his leadership. And the team will be working with him on, on that. And uh, there was some other procedural work with city council that I want to get done. But in June, as it often is, June is a very busy month and we could not get everything done that I wanted to do under my leadership. But that's fine. There's a new city manager now, and that will get done. The work will continue. I just wish I, I could have done some more. Yeah, put your signature on the bottom of yeah. the page, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. sure. Look back. Let's look back a bit at your uh, career. You started in in EMS. Uh, pick, pick maybe just you know maybe two major accomplishments if you want to go through your your EMS and city manager time. Well, uh, in you know, I I don't. Uh, I don't think I have any accomplishments. And, the, and these are awkward questions too, yeah. right? Like I've done lots of these, these sure. interviews and everyone kind of goes, oh, I'd like to thank the team. But seriously, though, what are the, the big things that you're, you're proud of? And maybe not just you, you know, obviously yeah. people support you, but what are the two I, big things? I am, the, the thing I'm most proud of are the teams that I have worked with uh, as, as members of administration. And I had the opportunity in many cases to build those teams, particularly as city manager, uh, within two years, I had built that entire team and I, I remain very proud of that team and how they work s together civilly and cordially, yet they challenge each other and they challenge me. They will speak truth to power. They will tell me if they don't agree with me or if they, I often hear Norm, I don't think you should do that. And I often listen. I, I accept sage advice and boy, they work hard and they're smart. Uh, they really do a service uh, for the city and I am grateful to them and really happy to be part of that. You know, if, if you were to give uh, maybe a piece of advice to council or, or also to the public mm -hmm. about what this, you know, what it's like to actually be here. Cause yeah. before I started at the city, I had a very different picture in my head as to how it works sure. compared to how it does work. What would you say? Uh, I would say this, <clears throat> don't succumb. Don't succumb to two trends that we see in society today. The first trend is a rising, an increase in distrust for public institutions. There are no conspiracies here. 
And the people here work hard. They do it in good faith, and they do it because they want to, because they want to serve. They want to do right. And that they don't agree with you or you don't agree with them is not, does not mean that they're not honorable. The people here are doing good and they're trying to serve. The second thing not to succumb to, you see it across the Western world, rising in civility, rudeness, ignorance, um, uh, ad hominem or personal attacks when there's disagreements in philosophy or disagreements in approach. It's, it's, it's not okay. The people, the people here, and I include elected officials, city council in this, they're here to serve. They are public servants. And those words have meaning. They serve the public. And when they get attacked personally, including by anonymous people on keyboards, it hurts and it's unfair. And it uh, diminishes the contribution that that person might want to make to increasing their experience in our city. A return to politeness and general respect would be welcome, I think, in all aspects of society. That's a pretty tough question to follow now, Orm. <laughs> uh, okay, you don't have to put on a shirt and tie tomorrow. You obviously didn't do that <laughs> yeah, no, today. No. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I know what you might be wearing tomorrow. <laughs> But what are you, what are you doing? I asked you six months yeah. ago if you had plans for retirement. You yeah. were not really sure. What, yeah. Have those two, have come any more clear for you? It, it is more clear. Uh, I could I I said it back then, and I will repeat it. I am not going to another job. I did not retire from the city manager to go take on in the, another executive job or leadership position somewhere else. That's that's not going to happen. There were rumors out there. It's, I was I was never going to do that. But there are things I want to do. I want to, uh, this is my hometown. Like we came from Cape Breton. We came here in 1981, but I grew up here. I lived here. Uh, my family's here. I got married here. My children are, are here and are returning. This is my hometown. Uh, I want Thunder Bay to be a better place, ever increasing. So I want to contribute to our community in, in small, quiet, but meaningful ways. Um, I want to teach. I've been very interested in teaching in academia for a long time, uh, and I'm interested in that sort of, that domain, that space. So I want to do that. And uh, I'm gonna, I say this all the time because it corners me. It forces me to see it to fruition in some way. I want to write a book. And the, it's in my head, uh, but it's, uh, it's about leadership. And we'll see how that goes. And I, uh, I want to watch more sports, read more books, exercise more, and become a better bagpipe player. Ooh, that last one. <laughs> Your neighbors are going to hate you. You know what? <laughs> no. They, they let me know when they don't hear the bagpipes, uh, ah. you know, in the evening around 5, 30, 6 o'clock when I'm <laughs> home kind of thing. So I play in the garage. <laughs> I play in the garage because my, yeah. my, my, my dog actually hates them. Like I take out my pipe case and the dog just cowers, right? So I... <laughs> I go and play outside. We, we have a little dog, and, and my sister-in-law has a little dog to bring us over. When I bring out the bagpipe case, they bolt. Oh, they're, yeah. They're gone. Yeah. Yeah, they don't like it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that your neighbors enjoy it, though. <laughs> they so do. That's good. Well, I don't, yeah, maybe they're teasing me, because, you know, the fact is, I'm not very good. And largely, it's only bagpipe players that can actually tell. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that's, that's the joy, right? You take a couple of gigs, and you go... They probably won't notice, <laughs> but you know what? Some pretty, some pretty lofty, uh, lofty goals are for retirement. I, I'm excited, and it's uh, you know, it's it's what I actually want to do, and I will get to pick and choose, not only the types of work that I do, but when I do it, yeah. and how I do it, and I'm uh, I'm excited about that. Can you sleep in tomorrow? Uh, eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. That's pretty yeah. good, man. It's, it's been, yeah, well, you know, shift work yeah, when I was a paramedic and then in the military too, kind of affected my sleeping patterns. So, um, yeah. 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 Well, I've got a, I've got a one-year-old that made sure sits 15 is like the latest. So, <laughs> yeah. so you, you enjoy I, eight o'clock. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Norm, congratulations. Thank you. Norm Gale, the former city manager here in Thunder Bay, his last day in the office was this past Tuesday. And a big thanks for listening to the Minutes this week. Of course, if you want more information about City Council, agendas, or minutes, visit thunderbay.ca slash council. If you want to listen to past episodes or maybe provide some feedback, visit thunderbay.ca slash the minutes. 
You can also find The Minutes wherever you get your podcasts. Plus, you can find us on YouTube and on our website as well. That's thunderbay.ca slash The Minutes. If you want to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening at City Hall, just hit that subscribe button. I'm Jeff Walters. Thanks for listening this week. We'll chat again in mid-July. Make it a great day.